Did everyone understand what he was talking about? <laughs> Don, next time turn the microphone on. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the reason I'm asking is because he asked for reserves. Sometimes people ask for reserves and they mean in place. Sometimes they ask for in place and they mean reserves. What are reserves? How do you define them? Okay, but how do you define the recovery factor? Sorry? Okay. So reserves means set against either an abandonment pressure, an economic limit, something like that. In place means that's the total in place volume. Keep that in mind. Christine, were you asking about the lectures being here? Because they all are now. Sorry. Didn't want to interrupt your train of thought. Okay, when we start talking about material balance, again, we left off with this discussion on uh, Monday. And what you'll be expected to do is recognize that there are some of the points which lie in a region that could loosely be defined by a straight line. And then there's another point, we're not sure why that one's there. And it's defined by a straight line, or we think it is. This is not written in stone, because this is not exactly theoretical. Theoretically, and we need to give them this paper, remind me to do that when we uh, will upgrade the, well, we'll include it from today. Huh? Gonzalez, yeah, and the presentation. So they can see that we've derived an equation that'll do this. And that equation is P over Z is equal to A plus B GP plus C GP squared. And that equation can be derived from theory. That's what we were uh, getting at the other day. The, the paper and the presentation will explain it all. It's sort of beyond the scope of this course. But what we were trying to explain is there's, there's a physical phenomena. Someone tell me what, uh, well, in the case of B, C, and then if you let this continue, somebody tell me what these coefficients are defined by. Anybody know? Take a wild guess. It is the C sub F function. Okay. We don't go into a lot of this back in that paper, but we will explain how this is related. We're not going to test you on this. We might give them a homework on this. Maybe, I don't know. We'll see. Some of you have pointed out that we're a couple of lectures behind and maybe we should change the test date. Uh, I got enough problems now as it is. And by the way, if you have a problem with the test date, tell us now. Several of you have. That's fine. We'll figure out a solution. But if I move it, I guarantee you half of you will have a problem with it. I mean, especially, Marmina, if we were to move it a week back, you know? Yeah, what's that called? Spring break? Yeah, why don't we do that? That way we can spend a little time together, get to know each other. <laughs> Dylan, anything else you can think of we need to talk about here? Okay. All right, and we talked about this case. This was Prasad, this fella, and this SPE paper, which you can all look up. And make sure that if you do look things like this up, 
you actually save a copy for yourself. That paper's kind of interesting. Okay, and then this is a simulation. One of you pointy heads, tell me why we did a simulation. Mr. Little, you literally have a pointy head, so tell us why. Uh, okay, I think we can control everything. That's why we do simulation, right? So all of the parameters in the system are known. The gas in place is 723. We can define that by the volume of the system, the state of the gas, pressure and temperature, right? So when we extrapolate this woolly booger, where is it supposed to go? Uh-oh, we got a typo. You see this, Dohan? You know what you're supposed to say? This is not my fault, Tom. You did this, and you'd be right. So if something's wrong here, don't worry about it. I just made an idiot out of myself. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> Some days it ain't worth getting up in the morning. This paper is somewhere in the Petty 324 notes, but we'll make sure that we shove it into this lecture note for today. And this is, well, to quote Mr. Stone's favorite song, about Rudolph, this is the most famous abnormally pressured gas case of all. Everybody looks at this gas case like it's some sort of holy grail. And why is that dangerous? Because it's observation based. Now they will tell you, and I'm probably going to screw this up like I just did something else, that it's a fault block delimited reservoir and this is the only well in it, this is the Anderson L, and it's produced, you know, however long it was produced, and there is no water influx, there's nothing else, it's high temperature, high pressure, you know, inside of here, and that's where the abnormal pressure concept comes from. So if we extrapolate this, and I better use a straight edge, pardon me, What's the answer supposed to be, Dylan? 120? But you're a lot of help today. Y'all know why he's mad at me? No, because it's Valentine's Day on the weekend. Did you guys all get your sweetie something? Mr. Cottle, care to comment? No hobbling English? Okay. So this is somewhere around 120, plus or minus. So you go to the bank and you tell them that you've got 120 Bs, plus or minus. Is that a lot of gas in today's prices? That's not bad. You could live comfortably on it. Buy yourself a Gulf Stream, maybe a wife number one, and you know, when that doesn't work out, wife number two. Did any of you guys go to the presentation last night for the Petroleum Club over in the business thing? The CEO of Petrohawk was there and he was explaining that he had a problem with women. He had eight kids and he needed to stop marrying them. That was pretty funny, actually. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, their mothers, sorry, not his kids. <laughs> that didn't come out quite right. My apologies. Uh, that's pretty good, huh? So now we're going to estimate our straight line off of this. Somebody please disagree with this straight line. Sorry? Only the last data points, because I crammed it through there. I knew what I wanted the answer to be. But you might do something like this. Oops. <laughs> Do 
Damn, man. I got to start bringing a straight edge. Whoa, that is it. No wonder you were laughing. <laughs> Be nice to old people, you know? They're the ones who are going to run over you when you're in the crosswalk. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, honey, what was that thump? <laughs> I don't know. Back up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's your argument, right? It could be two different interpretations. Well, that's why we went back and went to the basics and looked at this fundamental behavior. And I know none of you is going to understand it, but that's why we derived the uh, quadratic formula, or actually it's a cubic or a quartic if you want, but it's derived from the basis of the uh, formation compressibility. So I know this is a stupid problem. I don't mean it's stupid like uh, Forrest Gump or something, but I mean you, you have to have the data to define the problem. It's so isolated. Okay, let's have a let's have a a non-quiz quiz. Everybody ready? Yeah, ready? Sorry. Yeah, that's a good idea. Ready, Mr. Beard? Okay. Now, for a long time. How long is a long time? My age. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. So is this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So since the material balance came into play back in the 30s, people have been using this to analyze data. If you can tell me how to make this, in the words of uh, Rod Stewart, sexy, you know, have at it. Okay, in your case, sexier. While we're still young. Class? Okay, how do we get more points? At the getting place? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> we make a new <laughs> Anybody else? Dylan, did you read uh, Moran's thesis? Why not? Because it's in Spanish, right? <laughs> you read Turkish, okay? <laughs> we'll give him a copy of Moran's thesis, too. Uh, about five years ago, when we presented the two straight line methods, some guys from Mexico presented a derivative method, and what they were looking at was D, P over Z, DGP, and of course it has to be absolute value because it's going down, okay? Anybody want to tell me what that's going to give me? <coughs> Not just a straight line, but what kind of a straight line? Let's go back to the equation. So now, let's take the derivative, D, P over Z, DGP. All right, that's the derivative with respect to GP of, oops, forgot the constant. i got to stop saying oops. Dilhan, watch the time. By the way, Dr. Valco does not want to teach 620 with us. I don't know what his problem is. I don't think he likes me very much. All right, what's the derivative of 1? with respect to anything, okay? So that's equal to, I gotta write out all the terms. I mean, I can't have two standards, one for you and one for me, right? So Marmina, what are you getting your uh, girlfriend for uh, Valentine's Day there, buddy? Ooh. <laughs> I want you to try new things in our relationship. <laughs> I want you to work for a change, <laughs> not make me do all of it. OK. 
Okay. <laughs> so, next question. <laughs> What's the derivative of one, class? Zero. What's the derivative of x with respect to x? One. So this derivative thingy, dp over z, dgp, absolute value. You're a funny guy. I'm going to enjoy listening to this tape again at my uh, dis tenure hearing. <laughs> okay. So. If, in fact, we take the derivative of this thing, what do we get? Is pi a constant, lover boy? You okay? You're not, you want to throw the ball to somebody else? Where's Mr. Harlan? Is pi a constant? Is zi a constant? Is 1 a constant? is g a constant. Okay, so if we calculate the derivative of p over z with respect to gp, we should get a constant. And from that, we should be able to invert g out of it. Invert means solve for. I'm using this fancy language that you guys are going to have to use in, what is that, geostat class? Yeah, something like that. So, Dilhan's wondering where the hell I'm going with this. Why don't we take the derivative of this data? Somebody tell me. It doesn't matter. It would still tell you that it's not constant, which would be a value, right? They now are going to get a homework on this. It's going to hurt, too. All right? So what happens when you take this derivative, Mr. Stone? And then when you take this one? And when you take this one? And when you take this one and this one, it's going to bounce all over the place, right? So do you think using these data points, maybe 10 or 12 or 15 data points, you can get an accurate estimate of the derivative? No. You're going to be chasing artifacts. Now, with pressure transient data, where we have tens of thousands of points, we take the derivative of it, we pat ourselves on the back for being so smart, because we get a nice continuous function. But here you've got 10 or 11 points and they're jumping all over the place. Take the derivative, it's going to be pretty much meaningless. So if you could take the derivative, this would be one way of diagnosing abnormal pressure effects, water influx effects, normal pressure effects, etc. And that was exactly Moran's thesis, but it didn't, you know, it's not field practical. All right, so that's the rest of that discussion. Let's go talk about steady state flow for a minute. Now, what's the most important word that is missing from our discussion of steady state flow? Is this hat made in China? I bet it is. Dominican Republic. That's kind of like China. Okay, so anybody tell me what word is missing here? What word needs to be in parentheses? It is time independent. Bill Hunt, do we have any problems in life which are time independent? Name one. Aaron Clark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Name two. Marmina. Okay, so this is time independent. How does that help us? Mr. Little? It doesn't make a bit of sense to study this, right? But what about if we start, I want you to think about a movie, okay? When you're looking at a movie and the, the movie stops, I mean, this is the good old days when then it burned up, but for a second there, you had a still photograph. I mean, when, before Edison came along, well, actually, Edison did this too, they had hundreds of thousands of little pictures, right? And depending on the speed of the camera, you could see motion. Well, we're looking at snapshots of behavior with this time-independent concept. 
a significant fraction of you took Petty 311 with me, so you should be able to answer this question. Where does time-independent, or where do time-independent problems occur in petroleum engineering? In the lab. Why? And more specifically, there is a molecule per molecule replacement. What goes in equals what comes out. Now time independent, if we were looking at this, m dot in, which is mass in, minus m dot out, is equal to what, Dilhan? dm dt. Probably a minus sign or something like that, but who cares? We'll just put it in parentheses. Can you have mass accumulation? Can you get fat and then skinny? Yeah, you can have mass accumulation. All right? Is there mass accumulation during steady state? No. Do real reservoirs have mass accumulation? Of course they do. The whole thing is responding to stimulus. Can you achieve steady state flow in a water flood? Three options. Yes, no, or maybe. Second row. We have a yes. We have a maybe. We have a good. Why is it no? Because it is impossible to replace on a molecule by molecule basis. Okay? It is impossible. So even if you could perfect this in the laboratory, which we do, you're not going to perfect this in the field. All right, Dilhan, five minutes? Okay. Everybody ready for the next <coughs> wonderful experience here? How about all these equations? Have you seen them before? How many of you had me for 320, or 311? How many of you derived these equations for? Where'd the thingy go? Oh, there it is. Can you do it again? Mr. Zanero, this is probably most fresh in your mind because you're upset about the, was it nine hour final exam? Okay, well we'll increase your burden. How's that? Did you derive all these in 311? Should we do it again? Why not? Good answer. Dillon, are you comfortable having them do this again? Exercise is good, right? Okay. So you can imagine that we are going to require you to derive these, both for the linear flow case and the radial flow. What's constant fluid properties mean? What's constant here? Viscosity and formation volume factor. Okay? So, what does that really mean when we say it's constant? It means that these are not a function of pressure. Okay? So we'll come back and we'll discuss this some more in detail when we give you the assignment and you'll love us for it. Now, the liquid equations are the easiest ones to work with, again, because the properties of the system are constant. The fluid properties, pardon me. Well, actually, all the properties are constant. So, Dilhan, they're probably not going to like this, right, because we're going to make them integrate this equation and integrate this equation, right? They don't like that, but they'll do it. And over here, they get this logarithm thingy. And over here, they just get an X. So what do you notice the fundamental difference between linear and radial flow might be? Heather? Loco, you're here. Still haven't shaved, but you're here. Heather? Sorry? Right, so in the Cartesian case, or in the linear flow case, we have Cartesian x. In the radial flow case, we have a difference in logarithms. 
So what you can say is that we're rescaling the problem with a logarithm of radius. So all radial flow cases, when you think about radial flow, think about scaling in terms of the logarithm of radius. You're going to see this over and over again. We're going to emphasize this every single time. Now, if you carry this down and you write the equation for pressure in terms of distance, you have pressure at the well bore plus some stupid conversion constant, rate, formation volume factor, viscosity, permeability, cross-sectional area, and x. So the variables here are x and I guess technically Pw. Then we come over here and we have the pressure at any point in the reservoir, Pw, plus again this stupid constant, Qsc, formation volume factor viscosity, permeability thickness, natural log R over Rw, and of course we then have natural log of R, that's our variable where we're, uh, that we allow to change. So what do you see here, Heather? You see that for the linear case, the pressure profile is linear. For the radial case, the pressure profile is logarithmic. Okay? We're going to talk about this over and over and over again. Any questions before we move on to liquid, or sorry, gases? Okay. You guys just want your quiz. You hate looking at equations, but equations love you back. Okay, we're going to have to come up with some good ones for the test. Maybe like giving them not constant mu z, but, you know, mu z as a function or something. Really make them crazy. What do you think? I like that idea. It's a good game, right? All right, Mr. Zanero, since you're the oldest one in the bunch, what is P sub P? What is P sub P? is pseudo pressure, right? And what's its definition? <coughs> okay, so it's mu i over z i over p i integral p base to p p over mu z. Where does that come from? It comes from the from the fundamental relationships that we have. Sorry. Okay. But you had me for this. We had this on exams and everything else. Would you blank out, Mr. Little? Don't remember. Okay. Let's have a quiz before the quiz. I'm not going to ask you any questions because you've established, oh, <laughs> stop being a freak, okay? <laughs> I don't know what to say. No, I was trying to think that I got to really be nasty now, you know, unpleasant in order to overcome the stench of rebellion that I feel is, is coming forward. Somebody tell me what the units of pseudo-pressure are in this form. I can't believe you let me get away with writing DZ, Dilhan. That's P. Thank you. What are the units? Viscosity cancels with viscosity Z factor with Z factor pressure with pressure. What are we left with? Pressure. So what's happened is this allows us to transform a problem into what? Into an equivalent liquid problem. Why do we want to do that? Every time you look at a gas well test, from now until we stop doing gas well tests, the software will be working in pseudopressure. I guarantee it. I'll bet the lives of your children and grandchildren on it. It'll also be working in pseudo time sometimes, but it's going to be doing that. So you have to understand that this is a fundamental transformation. Why do people do this? Why do we work in pseudo pressure instead of in pressure for gas systems? 
because the properties are dependent on pressure. Now, Dilhan here, he has an idea that we don't have to do that anymore. That from now on, all we'll do is simulate the test and allow the pressure, uh, the pressure dependent functions to vary and we'll just solve that as a reservoir simulation problem. Is that a good idea? Why? Because we're looking for diagnostic behavior. So if we convert the gas problem to a liquid problem, then everything we did for liquid makes sense for a gas. That works. You guys ready for your quiz, right? Okay, let's talk about, well, uh, shall we let them have their quiz now? All right, we'll talk about this some more later on. Marmina.